Today I'm going to talk about man pages. Man pages are really useful, and um, a lot of folks use them. Folks despise them. We're going to kind of make them less mysterious. They are very, very good. They're the best documentation on them, um, and they're readily available when you need it. So, without further ado, let's get in on it. This is my outline today. I'm going to talk. I'm going to give an introduction. I'm going to talk about the man command itself. Talk about the uh, sections, um, return codes, about the files themselves, the man files, and about using man for programming. And finally, I'll wrap up with, uh, hey, how do I convert it to, how do I convert a man page to PDF? And look at it, my leisure, um, in case you need to. So I'm on FreeBSD 12.1, uh, release patch level nine, latest thing, as I know. And this, this talk will apply to Linux, Mac, uh, FreeBSD, et cetera, et cetera, but I'm gonna use FreeBSD as the system, because um, that's what I'm doing, the system programming stuff. Now, so if we type man without any other, ask what man page do you want? That's a kind of an in, a usage type of question, but basically I have to tell it something. I wanna say man, man. I wanna know more about the man command itself. So the man page system is the man command, which could even be just a script. Um, you can you can replicate man functionality using GROF, uh, but in ROF rather. Uh, but uh, the man page kind of makes it easy to do stuff. It uses less as a pager. We'll see all that. Yeah. Pages through the document forward somewhere on your system about that command. So man man, read about it. So um, the main command gives us uh, the system documentation in easy read format. That's kind of what it is. Now, it's history. Man pages were originally created, I don't know, probably before Research Unix version 6, uh, back in the 70s. It's been around a long time. Um, they're, like I said, they're canonical. It is the decisive documentation for a command. Um, but why are they useful? Well, they're useful because you want to know in a, in a really concise way what commands do, how they do it, what arguments they require, what those arguments mean, uh, any kind of weird uh, edge cases you want to know about. That's all described in the um, I've had conversations with folks who are, you know, are very skilled system administrators and that type of thing, and they hate the man. Oh, I read the handbook, or oh, I read this book by so and so. But I think that's a little bit, maybe not naive, a little more about the internals of their system than I do. But it's it's not not a good way of looking at it because you're going to want to know these things that the man page provides. And if you take some time now through the beginning to learn about how they work, you won't be intimidated by them, and you'll find them. Go back to man. Um, okay. When you when you first pull up a man page, it's going to fill up the screen and it's going to put a colon down here at the bottom and a blinking cursor. This this colon and the blinking cursor tell us that it's waiting for something. So it's a prompt. This colon prompt is a command. If I type H here, um, it's going to tell me, oh, this is running really the less command running. Um, inside of man to show us one page at a time, right? And the less commands uh, for navigating, we know that H pulls the prompt file, because I told you, Q will exit for any one of these incantations. Um, and then how you move around in the file. You can go F for forward a page, B for back a page, the arrow keys work, arrow up, <laughs> up arrow, down arrow, those types of things will move you around in the file. And you can also do searching. Searching is pretty important, so that's for that. So I'm going to hit Q when I'm done looking at the help. Now I'm back at this command prompt. If I type slash, that'll search for stuff. So we see on the screen right here this man dash F keyword. If I look for dash F, there, takes us, highlights the dash F and takes us to it. If I then press N, it'll go to the next, um, next occurrence of that dash F, which 
a description of what it is, and that emulates what is. Then I can type it again, and if the pattern's not found, I can press return back to the colon prompt. Um, go to the beginning of the file with a, by typing one and G, capital G, and take me back to the beginning. But anyway, or I could just exit and come back in. What is a man page? A man page is a document. So how's this document formatted? Well, first line is a header, and it shows us the name of the command, both sides of the screen, and the section in print. So this is in section one of the manual. Talk about sections in the back. This is really where FreeBSD general commands are discussed. This is the FreeBSD general commands manual, section one of the manual. That's the header. Next section is the name, then the synopsis, description, and so on and so forth. The name is the name of the command and a little brief description. So this tells us that man displays the online man. Synopsis is usage. So there are, there are different forms of the man command. There are three different forms in this case. Each line is a different form. And then anything in brackets is optional. So it has a whole bunch of optional parameters. And then it has a non-optional parameter, which is the page. When we typed man the first time and didn't supply page, it said, oh, that's not right. What page do you want? Because that is a requirement. So and then you can specify any number of other in the back pages, I guess. But the most common ones that we're going to use are um, dash K, which is searched by keyword in the man pages, the section number of a given page and uh, either this way or with dash s and uh, dash w another one we'll talk about it later but it, if we read on so that's the brief synopsis then we get into the description of the command and it's a little more uh, meaty description um, it says if you supply a man sec it'll restrict it to just those that section of the and then what are sections? Well, there's nine of them. And the most commonly used ones for a system programmer is gonna be these first three, um, which are general commands. Those are the, they, they are system. And then the system calls manual, which is the kernel provided function, and the library function provided in the standard lib. Uh, if we were kernel programmers, we'd be interested in the kernel interfaces. Uh, or if we were actually might be it. And then file formats are described in section five. There's a games manual, uh, miscellaneous info. Sometimes things aren't categorized properly, they get stuck in this. And then systems manager, kind of the admin manual is section eight. And kernel developers are in section nine. And then um, that's a bit about that. And after the description of the command, in this case, the sections we're to know about, um, there'll be options. All these options up here in the, uh, that are provided to the main command are described. I keep scrolling through this. You can see a bunch of these commands. Uh, dash K emulate, emulates something called apropos. Dash W displays the location of the and dash K was described. Then there'll be another section maybe of implementation, implementation notes. Not very frequently, but every once in a while. Has some detail about how it's implemented. Next section is the environment. And man pages are heavily dependent on the environment. So this is a pretty extensive section. Uh, normally the environment might talk about the localities. And then the next section will be about files. And this is pretty typical. You have a couple of files involved with man. One is the man conf and local configuration files as well. If you want to speak to those, you can read about those. Um, we don't know that yet, but yeah, I'm just. Then it describes the exit status of the command. Man utility exits with zero on success and greater than zero, usually one if an error occurs. And then a see also section. Um, see also is usually pretty interesting, not for man most. Um, it tells us everything that has a paren 1 are um, either most of the time they're utilities 
control system and uh, general commands. And then this thing that says intro, that's a special kind of an entry, but that's important too. And uh, we're going to look at some of those entry pages. There's an entry page for every section. Intro page. And then things that appear with section five are actual files. So that's the man.com file. We can read about um, the format of that file in this man page. And then there's some more intro sections and a doc and a man doc. So these M doc is in section seven. And if we remember what section seven was, it was the miscellaneous info. So miscellaneous info. But M doc is man doc. These are the format of this file um, when you look at it at raw text. And then there's a, a, a footer, and the footer is just shows when it was up, when it was created. Oftentimes, there's also a history section that tells you the history. When you get to the end, it just says end, and you can type you. Click the main command. Uh, the main. Next up, I said we look at intro, so we're going to look at man one intro. That's uh, one of the incantations of man was that we could supply a section number. So I want to look at the intro page. Since there's nine different intro pages, I just want to see the one for section one. Type one man, man one intro. Alternatively, I could have said, hey, man s one intro. Would have been the same. Right, this is a really short page that says, tells you about what general commands are. Um, section one contains most of the commands comprising the USB. ESD user environment, um, including text shells, filer tool, I pretty much a ton of commands to find out. Um, then it tells us, hey, all commands set a status value on it. Traditionally, zero signifies success, and a value greater than zero indicates. Um, with commands, true. When you run a command at the shell, it gives you a, an error code, gives you a return value. That return value is going to be zero. On success and probably greater than one typically one I mean greater than zero it's usually going to be one if there was an error um, so how do we look at this error so I'm gonna scroll down the bottom and make sure that I see all this we've got some see also stuff here and then it's got a history this was introduced to version 6 of 18 good news all right so there it is I exited what was the error code well we can find out with echo dollar question mark and we find out, hey, it successfully exited. Kind of figured. But when we want to know the error code, echo dollar question mark stuff. So that's a bit about man and the man command and how to look at it. I said man is a function that displays man pages. And pages are the bulk of the system. What about the man pages? Where are they? So the easiest way to find a man page is to type man w and then the command you're interested in. So let's find out where they put that section one command man. So man w man tells us it's user share man man one. And the file is actually man one.gz. It's a gzip file. We cat the man page. You can see that it's binary and it'll be. Okay, so that didn't work. It's a binary file. Okay, if we wanted to actually look at it, there's several ways we could do that. One is to use a utility called zcat, which is cat's zipped files. Yay, we could do that. Um, but since I want to play around with it, I'm just going to copy that file over here. So let's do pp uh, the man page to here. Now I have one uh, GZ. And I can use ZLess as well, sort of like ZCat. I mean, sort of like, yeah, like ZCat. And this will let me look at it. So in, in less, the same thing we were using for the, for the man, uh, for the man command itself. And H will bring us to the thing if we can't remember how to get around in it. But um, let's, Take a quick look at the structure. If 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 I wanted to before I do that, um, I could actually 
gzip dash t decrypt the thing um, in place, and that would result in a man one command that I could use regular command. And that one, I mean, that against it works now because I flipped it. Right? So that just makes it last so work. All right, so the format of this file, it's sort of like markup. It's mandoc markup, but not terribly different than HTML or anything else, other than practically unreadable unless you're familiar with these macros. But um, like this is a section heading called name. What's the name of the section? Man. It's a, it's a description display online document. And there's another section called synopsis. And if we scroll down, there's another section for the description. This maps pretty well to what we saw when we did man man. There was a section called name, uh, section section called name whose name was, and whose description was this, and a section synopsis. And so, so it's the markup that creates that view. Um, but in raw form, it's not simple to read. So if we wanted to read it though, we could use a utility called nrof. In order to do these types of commands, we had to. Uh, um, I had to install a few things um, beyond what's in there. Uh, I, guess. I had to install GROF in order to do this next bit, but eventually when I do the PDF stuff, we're gonna need JavaScript and base and EBM as well. I installed all three of these packages, maybe 10, 20 seconds. Now the way to do that is sudo package install this thing. This. It does it. And if it's already there, it's do it again. So anyway, if we had GROF installed, which we do, um, then we could use nROF or GROF um, in the name of the command, the actual file. So I could use, I used, um, well, I could use the full path except for it's gzipped. So I'd have to get it unzipped before NROF can. But if I do that, NROF will parse it into text and display human readable stuff, but it's, it's justified text and it's, it's helpful from a textual perspective, but not, not really. We need it. We need it formatted. So to do that, we tell it that we want it m dash t dash man doc man one, and that works. Now, what, before I go move on, uh, let me tell you that. Okay, so I did in rough dash t man doc, and, and you can see it's the same as the content that was created by just running the man command whatever it runs on. <laughs> it doesn't have page breaks or anything, but this is exactly the same content as what the man command generated. We can save that in a text file and just do it as a text file. So, uh, rough man, um, say we can. ST. Um, how to man. Does that work? Let's see. It doesn't work because it's got all kinds of uh, formatting characters for bold, italics, and stuff. So that's uh, not great. We'll, uh, we could probably figure it out, but I'm not going to worry about it right now. Um, we just want to view it on screen. So in rough dash tman dot one. There it is. We can see it on screen that way. Um, yeah, good enough. Um, one other thing I wanted to show you, though. Bear with me as I try to recollect, recollect the point I made with that note. Um, and rough dash t man duck one that worked. Oh well, if I think of it, I'll come back. Um, we're going to use that paradigm to create the PDF that we can view later, but we'll do that after we look at some man pages. So, back to uh, using man. Um, so, I'm going to talk about using man for systems programming. 
And the way I'm going to illustrate this is we're going to investigate the who commit. Uh, we're going to learn a bit about it. So if we wanted to replicate who's functionality, we'd need to know what it is. So let's type it, see what it does. It lists who's, who's online. If I do who, if I do man who, it'll tell, well, I'll do that in a minute. But if I do man dash who dash h, it's going to show me the header. It's going to tell me that this is the name of the person logged in, the line they're logged in on, the time they're logged in, and where they're logging in from. Um, if you're familiar with VMs, you know that I'm logging in. Okay, so who commands useful for finding out who's logged in? That's simple. So let's look at the man page for who. And who's our man page for you? So this is who, it's a general command, it's in section one, and it displays who's on the system. It takes a number of optional arguments. Uh, including file argument, uh, AMI argument, and some uh, short arguments that are like who dash A, who dash B, who dash A. We used who dash H. And then it describes the who command in a little more detail. By default, this includes the login name, TTY name, date and time of login, and remote host name. They're not local. You saw that. And it describes each of the options. And the dash h1 writes the column headings above the output, so that was useful. And then who am I, which is equivalent to dash m, show information about the terminal attached to standard input. So meaning this is standard input that we're looking at when we type on here, that's the input. Standard output is what we're seeing. If we want to know who's logged into this view, we type who am I, or who dash m. Then it says, hey, by default, who gathers information from some file? Um, var run UTX active. And there's alternatives. And there's a log file. And there's all kinds of stuff. Um, and there's some environment stuff. I told you in the first part that there wasn't usually much about that. And there's not. A few environment variables that can be. But not many. Um, and then there's a file section. It's said above, that's the main file. Then there's an exit status. The who utility exits are all in success. Greater than zero if an error occurs, it's typical. Some see also stuff, which this time we're gonna pay attention to, and the replicate who in program. So it's a, without looking at its source code. So we see also that there's some other commands related to who, that's interesting, might need that later. And then that there's a library function called get utx entry. Since we're going to be looking at utx active on some file, this probably relates to getting entries out of that. Who utility conforms to IEEE. New command appeared in version one. So it's been around a long time. And then uh, this file was created in 2012. So that's all we can glom out of that file. Thing called utx active. And what we notice, one thing we notice here is there's no section five entry for UTX active. And that's a shame. It'd be nice to know more about the file. But um, that's kind of, let's take a look at the file. Bar slash runs, UTX. It's a data file. So probably catting it's not a good idea to do that. And we can see that the information that who displayed came out of here because there's this WSIN and he's logged in on PTI 0, PTS 0, and he comes from 10.0.2.2. So that's interesting, but I'd really like to add it. So I'm going to pursue this um, to see if that'll help me this file. And I don't specify the section I could, but we'll hope we get lucky and get section three. If not, I can specify. That would be generally quicker to look for it. Be shocked when it comes up in a different section. All right? This is a this is a different kind of man page, even though it looks the same overall, because it describes a function. So 
but we're going to expect some differences. First off, it gives us the name of the functions that are documented in the command page. And there's a bunch of them. Interesting. There's in UTX entry, get UTX ID, line, user, line, set the UTX database, set the UTX entry. We'll figure out what they mean in a sec. But the one we looked for was this one, get UTX entry. Right. Um, this is included as part of the C standard library, so it's safe to use as a, a system function. I mean, in a systems program, there. And um, the synopsis then talks about usage. Well, the usage here is not, it's not a command to call. It's something to write in a program. So it tells us that first off, we have to include UTX temp. We want to have any hope of this ever working. All right, that will define or declare all these functions. The one we're interested in is this one, uh, or at least that's the one we're investigating. And it tells us that it returns a pointer to a utempx structure. That sounds promising because the foo function is going to display these entries, um, and we want to find them. So, what does it take to when you call get utx in? Uh, oops, sorry, get x entry. This is the one where not that one. Um, it doesn't take any parameters. So that's promising too because it means you don't have to really set it up. You just call it, and it'll return these things. All right. I'll arrow down, see what else, there's a bunch of these. Then there's a description. We're gonna read that description as a programmer. These functions operate in the user accounting database. Yay, that's what we want. It stores records of various system activities. That's good, we're interested in uh, users who are logged in, logs out, but also system startup, shutdown, modifications block, and the uh, system stores these in three databases, each having a different purpose. Uh, one we're interested in. Currently active logged in user session. Similar to the traditional UTEMP file, apparently there used to be something called UTEMP. Um, this file only contains process related entries, user login and logout record. But really, we're only interested in the login record of the logged in users, so we're going to ignore some of the entries. We don't know much about them. So we keep reading down. Does each entry in these databases defined by the struct UTEMPX? Then it tells us what a UTEMPX looks like. So we know that we can instantiate a UTEMPX and use all these fields. And these fields seem to be like what kind of entry it is. Is it a login? When that entry was made, with the timestamp, we're going to need that. And it happens to be a struct time dial, which we don't know anything about yet. And then record identifier process, and we don't care about any of that. But we do care about who's logged in. So we need the user, what line they're logged in, the TTY and the host, where'd they come from? Those sound, so it seems to me like if I can get an entry out of the who database, that active thing, um, and make it into a utempx structure, then I can just refer, I can just print out the user as a string, because that's what it is, the line is a string, and the host is a string, and then I gotta do something with the time. That would replicate who, right? So what is a ut type? Because we wanna know which people are logged in, so we read about it here. E type field indicates the type of the log entry, which can have one of the following values. We look at these and we can figure out most of these don't apply, none of those do. This one looks promising, user process, init process, that's probably not warrant. Um, login process, head process, I don't know what those are, but if I keep reading, it tells me that entries of type init process and login process, these two are not handled by the implementation. We're, we know it's not those, and dead process the whole. So it's got, the one we're interested in is user process. And we keep reading. So what about that structure? Okay, what do those fields mean? Well, I wasn't, it wasn't good enough with those comments. We can tell that TV is the time the event. Uh, and then user is the user login name. It's only applicable to user process, dead process, so we know. Then we talk about the line number. If no TTY is used, this field is left blank. So we at least need to check to see if it's not blank. Before we go displaying the paren uh, from address. And then host tells us about that kind of thing. Right? This implementation guarantees that all inapplicable fields are discarded. These are always guaranteed to be null terminated. Convenient. 
All right, and then it says, hey, this one that we're interested, the get UTX int function can be used to read the next entry database. So do we have to open the database? Maybe, maybe not. A good test-driven development, Just try it, see what breaks. But point of fact, you don't need to open it because it gets the next entry. And if you've not opened it, it's the first entry. Um, and if you read through the whole thing, you'd eventually figure out that set UTX entry database opens the active session database. So you can use it to open one, um, either set it or you can specify a file. But you don't actually. It'll work just fine. And then it goes on for days, but we won't, don't have to read any of that stuff. Read about it later when something doesn't work the way we expect it to. Um, then uh, we'll look at the return value. So the return value of get UTX entry is a pointer to a UTMP extract or null when it reaches in the file. So know now what to call. Well, it's about the types of errors. Error conditions are like this and that stuff. It gives us a see also list of related functions and then some uh, system calls that are related to it, like your time of day, ID, can't use it. section four stuff, I forget what it is, oh, kernel stuff. Then um, some administrator calls that are related to it and some standards. We can read about the IEEE POSIX standard if we wanted to. If there's anything else. Get UTX, this one, and the UT host field of the UTMP extractions. So if we use UT host, which we will, if we were writing here, um, just realize that that's an extension to They first appeared in FreeBSD 9. They are replaced, they are, sorry, they replaced the old UTEMP agent. This guy here, Ed Shooten or Shooten, the guy that, probably the case. So we know that we have to include, go to the beginning, but we know we need to include UTEMP. If we were going to write it, we'd create a new file and we'd include UTEMP. And then we would uh, declare a struct pointer for utempx, maybe call it utemp pointer entry. And then we could call get, get utx int uh, to get us list of those. While we get those, we could print out the entry arrow, um, whatever fields that are appropriate, ut host, uh, ut line, and so on and so forth. It would be that simple to write. Then we could go a little bit deeper because we don't know what this time val thing is. So let's find out what a time val is. We're going to get one, so we might as well find it. So we type man time val. And we're horribly disappointed when it says that there isn't an entry. But we don't give up. We see if we get lucky with a keyword search for time val. And lucky is a relative term, but just describing earlier, the ones that end in parens are the ones we care about. So here's one that talks about operations on time vals. Yeah, that'll be that'll be interesting. Okay, then uh, there's another one that ends in nine, which these are uh, I forget what they're not relevant. To, we're gonna see if we don't care about section nine. What would, so this one looks good. Let's do a man. So I can get one of these man pages to show up. I can pick any of these. So I could pick timer sub and timer sub. Doesn't matter. Any one of these will pull up this page about the operations of time val. So I do man timer sub, pulls up at section three of the manual. Its name is all these different ways of thinking about it. In order to use it, we need to include sysTime. And then there's some functions, but we're not we're not really looking at the functions right now. So we go to the description. These macros, which is apparently what all those were, are provided for manipulating time valves. Uh, for use with all these other things. Time val description structure is defined in this. So a time val is nothing more than a struct that has a long TV underscore sec and microsec. The TV sec gives us the second since January 1st. 
So we could do some math and figure out what date it is. That's crazy talk. Um, but we could. But this gives us a, that's all it gives us back. So in order to use this, the main pages, we could kind of dig around and kind of find our way to, to stuff that would be useful. But if you program for any time, length of time at all, you know that there's local time. Different than the second since the epoch. But we'll figure it out. So this gives us, uh, gives us a way to transform binary date and time value. Okay. A local time. And in order to use it, we have time. This time, you can include the other sysTime thing too. That works. That takes some experience. But uh, local time, this is the one we're kind of going to look at, is a way to convert from some time t thing. We don't know what that is yet. I don't know what a tm is, but below tells us that this I'll take as an argument a value representing time in seconds since the epoch. So local time takes number of seconds since the epoch, which is exactly what we had before, um, and returns uh, a local time to a struct called tm, which will be useful for us to do some other work. Well, let's see if it has. Well, sometimes you have to Google a little bit to figure this out. If I did Google this, friends, Google, and I looked for um, vert, uh, oh, I guess, and see. Clear. For P time, for F time. P. P underscore. It tells us in the answer on Stack Overflow, hey, convert the TV sec using local time and stir F time, then append the, the, we don't care about microseconds. So how does that look? Well, it looks like this. You, you instantiate a bunch of stuff. You get a time in seconds. We'll just say we already have that, but now time. And it'll return this uh, now TM thing, which struct TM that local time returns. And then we can use stir F time to create a string out of it whatever format. So then we can look in here and see that there's a struct TM. The TM structure includes at least the following fields. So when you convert from that second since the epoch, it'll generate a TM struct that has a bunch of different fields we don't really care about because we're just going to pass the TM struct. That's kind of it. Go back to We go and it's got this struct tm that it returns and we said that stir f time is a way to format the date and time given struct tm there's the struct tm pointer the night that long declaration that you, hey you're passing in this um, and then you pass it in a format and a buffer to put it in and it'll do the conversion. If we read about it, we can find out what the conversion parameters are. We could say, oh, percent B for the step and uh, D for the bat or something. Um, which would get us to who dash, get us to where we could display just exactly like they did. This would be percent B. This would be a percent Y, capital Y, I think, the year, and then percent H for our colon percent. I'd look like percent B, 
Percent Y, percent H, colon, percent M. Would be the formats for F time. And then we just pass it times some, uh, the local time that we have. So that's a little bit of an investigation into kind of how we can do learn from the standard I.O. is a uh, the bulk of the library input functions. So if you want to know about more functions that are uh, present in the standard library, standard library for standard I.O., they're all described in this file. Goes on for days. For now, friends. All right, enough of that. Um, how we can use man pages to find out about. So moving these to PDF. That was the last one I wanted to show. You. So we have a man page locally called man. one. I copied it, unzipped it. Um, we can use GROF, ht dash man doc. And one that one. You can use that to create a man uh, one postscript version of it. And on a Mac, you can open a postscript file. So on a PC, you got to do some special stuff, but you can also open it. But it's more convenient to have it as a PDF. So we can use PS to PDF. And if no errors occur, then you have it. If you then want to get it, uh, you have to get it on your system somehow. If you're on FreeBSD, you can just open it directly. Um, but it, you're running the GUI. With it. So I'm going to copy it over to the Mac and I can get that because I'm using SSH. And then I called it man. directory then I can open it and see it in all its glory. So there it is. It's the man page from PBST and it's in a nice PDF so I can read it quickly and easily. So that's all I wanted to share. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed it.